Uh, hi, everybody. Glad that you're here. Um, excited to, to, to dive into this topic. Uh, it's one that I've, it's probably the first time that I've delivered all of this content in one place before. I've delivered bits and pieces of it um, throughout many different presentations, but I've never sort of done a deep dive on this subject in one location before. So <laughs> bear with me. And I think we also said in the, in the show notes that there will be more questions than answers potentially today, because this is we're diving a bit into the to the unknown territory of, of bumblebees here. So we'll be tackling topics that aren't fully understood, and I'll be trying to share, you know, the best information that I have with you all. Um, and hopefully you'll all have some good questions and we can potentially talk about potential answers or way that we might be able to tackle those answers. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about the life of the bumblebee queen, and we're going to talk about cuckoo bumblebees too, and, and try to get into some of the details of their biology, and ecology um, and, and why that's important. Before I get started, um, we're just gonna talk briefly about the Xerces Society. Um, we're, we're a nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1970 by the gentleman by the name of Bob Pyle. We are named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly to go extinct because of human activity. It was native to the San Francisco Bay Area. Since then, we've grown into, a, I guess we can't really call us a small nonprofit anymore. We're a medium-sized nonprofit. We have about 100 employees all over North America. Um, and we have a number of different conservation programs. We have a native pollinator program that focuses on sort of working lands and helping farmers to increase biodiversity on their farms for pollination and other services. We have an endangered species program, which is who I work for that focuses on imperiled animals and how to manage lands to better protect them. And then we have an aquatic invertebrate program that's largely focused on freshwater mussels. We have a butterfly conservation program and then a pesticide program that sort of serves as the umbrella for all of those other programs and ties them together. We approach our work in a number of different ways. We use um, advocacy, research, and education like this um, to reach audiences and to advocate for um, animals um, and their protection of their habitat. We have an incredible team here at Xerces. I just want to highlight my bumblebee team here who are a group of people I get to work with very closely on a daily basis. I'm constantly learning from them. And a lot of the information that I'm sharing here today will have come from conversations or research that they've done. And I just value being able to work with them so much and want to acknowledge them uh, up front. Likewise, um, the rest of the folks here at Xerces, including our admin staff, um, are just fantastic people that are doing incredibly important work. And we wouldn't be able to do it without the support of our members. We are a member supported organization. And for any of you that are members, thank you so much for being a member and supporting the work of Xerces. If you appreciate what we're doing and have the ability to become a member, we really welcome you to join us. And there's a URL there for you to do that, xerces.org slash donate. And you can see the menu of, it, of options that are available to you. A lot of people, when I meet them for the first time, ask me, you know, why? <laughs> If I'm on an airplane, for instance, and I sit down and they ask me what I do, and I tell them that I work for an invertebrate conservation organization, a lot of folks will ask me, you know, why, why invertebrates? Um, you know, those are the, the things that are pests in my lives. And a lot of people see it that way. I know that we're probably preaching to the choir here. This is a self-selecting group of people um, that understand why invertebrates are important. But I do think it's important for us to continually talk about it so that we can have it in front of us and talk to our peers just so we better understand how this works and we can bring invertebrates into the, the common understanding and appreciation that people have when we consider wildlife. In many places, insects and invertebrates aren't considered wildlife. They're really thought of as pests and we need to change that conversation. We need to understand that insects are important, that they're beautiful and that we need them. Um, and indeed, uh, the, the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own because they are so important in ecosystem function. They're out there decomposing and returning nutrients to the soil, which allows new plant growth to happen every spring, which is really the fabric um, of the ecology of, the, of, of, the, of Earth. They're conducting biocontrol on our farms and our gardens, reducing the need for chemical inputs. They're the base of the food chain, directly feeding fish, songbirds, mammals, 
And they also conduct pollination. And pollination is an important service that we're all very familiar with and we're going to be talking a lot about today. Pollinators are incredibly important for their ecosystem service in that they help maintain plant biodiversity on the planet. When most people think about pollination, they're largely thinking about what's happening on farms and gardens and how we get our fruits and vegetables. And I'm not disagreeing with that. I think that pollinators are certainly important for farm fields, but potentially more importantly, at least in my mind, it's essential for really maintaining the ecosystem that we live in and that every animal on the planet lives in. Native bees are responsible for the vast majority of pollination in our natural areas, and we wouldn't have these diverse areas without them, without healthy pollinator populations out there doing what they do. And I think it's important to recognize that not only is what we see in terms of plant diversity important, being able to see that diversity and the multitude of colors that we see when we're out hiking in natural areas or visiting those natural areas. But that plant diversity is also incredibly important for ecosystem function. There's more to the eye, more than the eye can see in terms of nutrient cycle and soil stability and water filtration and carbon sequestration that happens with diverse plant communities. Diverse and healthy plant communities mean healthy ecosystem function. And this is a graph that was made quite some time ago, but just shows in a prairie ecosystem, while we can only see what's above ground, what is happening below ground is, is truly important and essential in terms of maintaining the stability of prairie ecosystems. Sometimes the root systems of the plants that we see there go down well below their stature on the ground. So sometimes up to you know, 15 feet below the ground, those root systems are working um, to, to filtrate water and to keep the soil stable so that we can have a long-term healthy ecosystem. On top of plants, of course, pollinators are also important for wildlife. Um, they're, they're providing nesting and overwintering structure, perching structure, shelter structure for lots of different animals, and then also providing the fruits and seeds that feed wildlife. Everything from songbirds and mice and snakes all the way up to bobcats and grizzly bears have some component of their diet that is dependent on plants, and we wouldn't have those foods without our pollinators. Diving a little bit deeper and getting narrower to our subject for the day, bumblebees are incredibly important pollinators. They're important on farm fields, they're important in, um, in our gardens, but they're also important in natural areas, especially areas that are in higher elevations and higher latitudes. Um, because those areas are colder and wetter, they're often dependent on animals that can fly in poor weather. Many bees, including honeybees, tend to be sort of fair weather friends. They only come out when, <laughs> when it's sunny and warm and, and, um, and they can fly around quite easily. Bumblebees have really unique physiology in that they're able to regulate the internal temperature of their bodies, which is important as we'll learn in a little bit for, um, for rearing their young, but it's also important for being able to fly in cold and wet temperatures. So they're out there flying sometimes close to zero right after the snow melts when a lot of other animals just aren't flying around on the landscape. They're also incredibly intelligent. They have long tongues, which allow them to access floral resources and many different kinds of plants. And they're innovative and able to use their strength and resources for buzz pollination and a number of other aspects. Unfortunately, um, bumblebees are facing some degree of extinction risk. We have around 47 species in, in North America and around a quarter of them are facing some degree of extinction risk. So, you know, 13 species or so have begun to disappear. They're disappearing from large portions of their range, which covers large portions of North America. And this is certainly concerning. It's also interesting that we have some winners and some losers. What is it that about those winners, the ones that are least concerned, why are they doing well when they live in largely some of the same places that the species that are not doing so well? There must be something about their biology or ecology that is different. Um, and it, us as conservation biologists, it's our job to try to figure that out so that we can do a better job of protecting the species that are disappearing. And I think as you all know at this point, we just have a, a limited understanding at a species by species level 
of what these animals need. And that is largely the goal of Zero Sea's bumblebee conservation program is to better understand the individual needs of each species throughout its entire life cycle so that we can do a better job of conserving them and enacting on the ground conservation efforts that are actually evidence-based and directed towards the portion of need. And that is why I wanted to spend so much time today talking about the solitary phase of the bumblebee queen. We, um, we spend so much time or most of our observations of bumblebees are, are of the workers that are flying around our gardens or when we're capturing them in, in the summertime to do research on them. And we don't think about what's happening below ground. And so much uh, of the reason for bumblebee decline are all of these threats that are on the landscape. We have pesticides, global warming, we have drought, we have forest encroachment that are all impacting bumblebees' lives. And most conservation efforts for pollinators and other bumblebee, sorry, for most bumblebees and other pollinators is focused on planting flowers. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We should definitely be planting flowers to protect bumblebees and other pollinators. But we have no idea what the impact of what these threats are, are on where they nest and where they overwinter. And it could be, and I'm not saying this is the case, but it could be that planting flowers or that the lack of flowers isn't the problem. It could be that overwintering sites are laden with pesticides and that is killing off some of these species. We just don't know the answers to those questions. And so until we, until we better understand the biology of the queen and how they spend the solitary phase of their life cycle, we can't fully begin to appreciate what we need to do to protect these species. It could be in the end that we learn that <laughs> it was flowers all along, but until we have that information, we can't really make that determination. So we need to do a better job of thinking beyond flowers and thinking about nesting sites and thinking about overwintering sites. But <laughs> until we can, before we can sort of think beyond flowers, we also need to better understand where they're nesting and where they're overwintering so we can focus on the conservation of those resources. Especially when we start thinking about bumblebees at a species by species level. Here are the 10 or 10 of the 13 species that are facing some degree of extinction risk here in North America. And many of them are actually all of them at this point have been petitioned for either federal listing or state listing. And so when that happens, obviously there are if a species gets listed as the rusty patch bumblebee or Franklin's bumblebee have, then regulations come and recovery plans get put in place. And then we start doing things to protect them and to help reco them recover. But unless we know, again, where they nest and how they overwinter, so much of that is going to be focused on sort of these nebulous threats. So our goal is to better understand at a species by species level what these animals are doing so that we can again, protect them with evidence-based conservation measures. And just a, a plug for, um, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about this towards the end of my talk today, but just a plug for, for our Bumblebee Atlas programs, which are now active in 20 states throughout the US. You can learn more about it at bumblebeeatlas.org. But what we're doing through this program is learning where these animals are thriving. We're learning what plants they're using, but most importantly, we're learning sort of where we can find high concentrations of some of these rare species, which allows us to go in and do more research about their life history, about where they're nesting, about potentially where they're overwintering. And we can't do that. The first step in learning how to do that is actually finding where they are in the landscape. And we need your help to do that. So if you're not engaged or don't know anything about our Bumblebee Atlas programs, I would encourage you to, to check out bumblebeeatlas.org and get involved in our conservation programs. Okay, um, so that's sort of the preamble for why we're doing what we're doing today. I'm going to do a real brief overview of bumblebee ecology, and then we'll dive into the life of the bumblebee queen and the cuckoo. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned before, there are around 50 species, just short of 50 species in North America. They are most diverse in our western mountains, so along the Cascade Sierra Crest in the Siskiyou Mountains along the, the coast in California and Oregon, um, and then down the Rocky Mountains. And then there's kind of a unique area where sort of east meets west around the Black Hills in South Dakota that is also a really unique 
biodiverse area. Um, you can also see more generally that, that along northern areas is where we have the most species, not the far north, but in sort of the, the middle north uh, of North America is where we have the most species, sort of in the 16 to 20 species range. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a general bumblebee life cycle, many of you have probably seen this before, starts with a queen emerging from the ground in the spring. She flies around and looks for a nest location. We'll get into a lot more detail about this in a minute. Once she finds her nest, she builds it up. She builds up resources. She gets a worker cast that brings in resources. The colony gets bigger and bigger until towards the end of the season, the nest starts producing the reproductive memories of the colony, the new queens and the males that will form next, or I'm sorry, the males won't form next year's colonies, but those new queens will after they mate. And then they'll find a place to overwinter um, in the ground. And then they start the cycle anew and the founder's queen, all of her workers and the males all die off. So they have a, a single year, one year annual life cycle. And if we take sort of this beautiful figure that, in my mind, illustrates the life cycle really well, we can break it down into step-by-step -step processes and start thinking about sort of the solitary phase versus the social phase of the bumblebee. And this is where we're really going to start diving into some of the specific issues around queens. So if you think about sort of week zero as the, the time that the bumblebee queen emerges from her hibernacula, she'll spend a couple of weeks searching for a nest site. And again, we'll talk about that more in detail. Once she establishes her nest, she starts provisioning that nest with pollen and nectar. Um, and then she'll start laying eggs. And those eggs in the beginning will develop mostly as workers. And then towards the end, she'll start producing the reproductive member of the colony. She sort of does this at a brood by brood, at least in the beginning, phase. Um, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. But in the beginning, we sort of the first brood development, which is their first group of young that will develop to become the workers of the colony. She'll lay eggs. There are eggs for, you know, a little less than a week. And then their larva for a week or two. And then their pupae for two weeks. And then they emerge as winged adults four to five weeks after they are, have originally laid. It's at that point that the queen no longer leaves the nest. And she focuses purely on laying eggs and founding her colony and the workers keep bringing resources in. So she'll continue to have workers then that will emerge later and we'll get into more details about this. And then at the very sort of, at that time, the colony has gotten big enough, they're bringing in enough resources that she starts producing the reproductive brood or the reproductive members of her colony, those new queens and males that we talked about. That comes towards the end of the season. And then we're gonna talk about queen worker conflict, which I think will be interesting that maybe some of you haven't really thought about or, or learned about before. Um, and then again, those queens will, will fly out on the landscape, they'll find a mate, and then they will enter their hibernation. And so the time phase here is, is sort of a compressed. You can think about this as probably the shortest possible timeline for a bumblebee to finish its reproductive cycle would be about you know 15 to 20 weeks would be as, as short as it possibly could. Some species likely extend that long into the fall. And you know, oops, sorry. Um, and can go as long as 35 or potentially even more lot longer, um, a longer period of time, depending on resource availability and drought and all of those other conditions. Some of these nests can build up to well over a thousand individuals. A more typical nest is probably between, you know, 100 and 400 workers is, is probably a more typical size. So that's sort of our goal for today is to sort of tackle that. And we're going to sort of avoid that middle part of the life cycle. We're not gonna talk so much about the workers. We're gonna talk about more what the queen is doing in the nest while the workers are out doing her thing. So um, in, as I mentioned, in early spring is when, or not necessarily early spring, but at some time during spring is when the queen emerges from her hibernacula. The evidence that we have suggests that she emerges from her nest when soil temperatures are somewhere between 55 and 62 degrees Fahrenheit. So the sun, so in those two different scenarios, you can imagine that being on a north-facing slope or a south-facing slope could have a different strategy. So 
potentially in far northern climates in the Alpine region, I'm sorry, the Arctic region, say, of, of North America, where it's really cold and the season is very short, you can imagine that a queen bumblebee might overwinter on a south-facing slope such that they reach that temperature as early as they possibly can and take advantage of the resources when they're out. You might imagine that in a more southerly um, or lower elevation area, that they may nest or over, I'm sorry, they may overwinter on the north facing slope of a little mound such that the soil temperatures don't reach 55 or 62 degrees Fahrenheit until conditions are really, really ready for that bumblebee to go out and do their thing. So different strategies, probably in different locations and different environments will depend on where they're emerging or where they have spent the winter time. Um, but nevertheless, once the spring war warms up, you know, that's, or, or the, once the soil temperature warms up, that's when queens sort of emerge and start doing their thing. So you may sort of wonder, what can I do to help? There are a number of things that you can do to help overwinting bumblebees. Um, one of the things is just leaving leaf litter in your yard all winter long. Avoid tilling and raking all winter long. You want to avoid disturbing those overwintering queens. If we, if we disturb them before they're ready to wake up, they're likely not going to survive and, and found a colony the following year because they'll, they'll destroy their fat reserves that they've built up the, following, the previous fall. So avoid raking, tilling, avoid treating lawns with any pesticides until temperatures in the spring have warmed up. And, and the answer to have they warmed up is, would you consider planting tomatoes outside yet? If you wouldn't consider planting tomatoes outside, it's probably best to leave some of that garden, garden work until later in the spring. Another thing you can do to help this phase of the life cycle is to plant early blooming trees and shrubs. Um, you'll, you'll see in a minute that, that on almost a per day basis, the bumblebee queen probably needs to visit somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 flowers a day in order to uh, found a nest. So having as many early blooming resources on the landscape as possible is absolutely essential for this phase of the life cycle. Once the queen has emerged from it, her, her hibernacula, she's gonna go out and spend a bunch of time looking for a suitable nest location. And um, it's believed that this process can take days or even weeks. Um, and what this body of research here was actually done by Genevieve Pujesic, who's one of the folks that I acknowledged in the beginning here. She's on our bumblebee team and runs our, our Midwest um, and Great Plains Bumblebee Atl Atlas projects. But she did this really elegant research for her graduate work that showed that bumblebee queens spend more time looking in areas for nests um, in high quality habitat. So the, the lines that you see here, the yellow lines were in a hay field, the light green lines were in a, in a meadow, and the dark green lines were in a forest. And what, the, what she did for her work is she measured sort of how long bumblebees flew in a straight line before each turn. And she found, as you see here, that they spend a lot more time flying in straight lines in what we would call poor habitat than they did in what we would call rich habitat. So later in the year, they then looked for bumblebee nests and they found more bumblebee nests in this forested habitat, a, a medium amount in the, in the meadow area and the grassland area and very few bumblebee nests in the hay field. So we can sort of determine that bumblebees are gonna spend time nest searching in areas of high quality habitat. They're gonna spend more time looking. If you haven't seen this behavior before, um, I sort of put together this video or I found this video online just to give you some sense of what a bumblebee queen looks like when they're um, searching for a nesting site. This video is a little frenetic, um, but you do get a sense of what a bumblebee queen is looking like. So it's flying low over the ground and she's, she's looking for holes, she's probably smelling, she's probably trying to figure things out. And she'll often you know, land on the ground and start digging down um, and looking for a place potentially to build a nest. So here she's in some thatched grass, potentially there's a rodent burrow somewhere underneath there that she smells that she's trying to get down to. She's poking around, she's trying to get down in there, you know, and then occasionally she'll get back up and try to fly on to the next, next site. But this is the kind of behavior that we see in really what's likely to be high quality bumblebee nesting habitat is lots of behavior like this of, of going into holes and coming back out and then 
flying around. So when all is said and done, you know, what, what, can we, what can we discern from this? Where do bumblebees nest or where do they prefer to build their nest? In a separate body of research that's come out, um, there's, uh, they did, this was kind of a metadata study where they looked at all of the different research that's out there about bumblebee nests. And on the left, left here, you sort of see the landscape level um, habitats where different bumblebee species nest. So these are divided up by bumblebee sub, subgenera. Um, so the Thoracobombus, just to give you some sense of the different species that they're talking about here, most of you are probably not familiar with bumblebees at the subgenus level. So I'll try to describe some of it for you and give some common examples of species in these different subgenera so that you can sort of understand a little bit better. So the Thoracobombus, some examples of species in that subgenus are like Bombus fervidus or Bombus californicus, you may call it that if you're on the West Coast, or Bombus pennsylvanicus. In the subterrano Bombus, um, that's Bombus appositus or Bombus borealis. Um, you'd have to probably live in some, not that many regions of the country would have those two species, but you might be familiar with those. But the pyrobombus are the most speciose um, group here in North America. It would include species like Bombus impatiens, Bombus vasostenskii, Bombus flavifrons, Bombus vegans, Bombus melanopagus. Um, those are sort of the, the common pyrobombus species. The columnobombus are would be like Bombus griseocallus and Bombus rufocinctus. Um, the Bombus sensu strictu would be Bombus in, in the strict sense. Um, that's Bombus affinis, Bombus occidentalis. Um, the Bombius subgenus would be like Bombus uh, nevadensis and Bombus aracomus. And then the alpino bombus would be Bombus curbialis. Um, I think that's the really the best North American example, unless you're way up in Alaska or up in Northern Canada, you might see a few other species there. The ones that are not in red here are just subgenera that are in Asia or Europe, um, and we don't find here in, in North America um, where I'm focusing sort of this information on. So that's just to give you some sense of, of which species are in these broad groups that are discussed here. And you can see that, um, you know, these are uh, on the far left here are the number of studies that have been done on the different ones. So you can see, you know, the best studied group are the, the Bomba Sensu Strictu. For all time, there's only 48 studies <laughs> on, on the nesting biology of, 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 the, of the 17 species in that group. And the, the studies that have been done have only covered seven of those 17 species. That's what the information on this graph shows you. So we're sort of pulling out a lot of information here, but really it's based on only a, a subset of the species that are out there in the world. So this is a, again, this is not a species by species look at things. This is a really gross or, or large scale way of looking at things. But what we can take from this is that bumblebees, at least at the subgenus level, will largely nest in a lot of different areas, agricultural areas, forest, forest edge, grassland, um, those are all fairly well represented in every single subgenus. The same thing when we look at sort of above ground versus surface, surface versus underground, you can see that every subgenus except for this Styracobombus, which again doesn't ha doesn't occur here in North America, every other group has been found either above ground, on the surface, and underground. So basically, we could consider by just looking at this without looking at a species by species level that bumblebees are nesting generalists; that they'll nest basically everywhere. But again, this isn't a species by species look. We really have only looked at a subset of the species. And um, there aren't that many studies that have actually done this before. But generally speaking, if we look, it sort of looks almost if you squint, maybe we could say that across all species that around half of them nest underground. Um, you know, then again, uh, maybe a third of them are uh, on the surface of the ground and then maybe, you know, 17 percent or so are, are above ground. That's sort of the rough categories that, that we can say about this. Again, it's difficult to tell at a species by species level. Um, how to help bumblebee nests? Be messy in your yard. Leave the leaves, um, leave parts of your yard unmown, um, leave messy structure, leave brush piles, leave compost piles around. 
grow lots of early flowers, plant early blooming trees and shrubs. And if you want to, you can provide artificial nesting structures, but think about the insulation and structure inside of those are things that you can do. There's information about how to do all of those things on our website. I'm not gonna to focus too much on it here, but if you do wanna think about it, please, please check those things out. When the bumblebee goes to, after she's found her location, let's say it's a subterranean or an underground nest in an old rodent burrow, she starts founding her nest. There are two different groups of bumblebees in the way that they rear their young. And I'm just telling you this, not because we're not going to get into the details of it, but mostly just because I think it impacts what we really know about bumblebee nesting in that. So there are these what are called pocket makers and there are pollen stores. The pocket makers sort of rear all of their larvae in one big brood clump. Think about it that way. And the pollen stores, each larvae sort of gets their own capsule where they get to, you know, eat their own pollen and they're fed individually. That's sort of the, the broad categories of the way that bumblebees build their nests. Pocket makers are very, and these are the ones that brood sort of all of their larvae in one big brood pile. They all get fed together. They're very difficult to rear in the lab. Like, like almost impossible. I, I shouldn't really say almost impossible, but very difficult. Because of that, studying the nesting biology of those species is incredibly difficult. We're just not able to do it. And so most of what we know about what happens in the nests and, and other things is based on the pollen stores, the ones that are easily reared in the lab. Your Bombus impatiens, Bombus vasnesenskii, Bombus oxidentalis. These are the ones that we've been able to rear in labs and, and figure out their nesting biology. So I'm just telling you this because what I'm about to share with you about what happens in the nest with the queen is really only based on these pollen stores and potentially leaves the pocket makers somewhat out in the dry. Out in the dry, that's a terrible, I don't know what I meant to say there, but out in the dry was not, not left out to dry. Maybe that's what I was trying to say. Um, we, we don't necessarily know exactly what goes on in the nesting biology there. So, but once she founds her nest, and, and this is an important, really important time in the biology of the bumblebee queen. It's really important that there's some insulation in that nest because temperatures need to be at a fairly stable level of around 80 degrees Fahrenheit inside that nest in order to provide a suitable environment for those eggs to develop properly, the larvae to develop properly, and them to pupate. And so the queen spends a lot of energy at first collecting pollen and nectar and bringing it into the nest. And she, she forms that brood cell that you see there and then lays her eggs directly on that brood cell. And then she'll spend a lot of her time just incubating. As I mentioned earlier, bumblebees are able to regulate their temperature so that they can fly in cold temperatures. In the nest, the queen uses that to regulate the temperature of the nest. So she'll sit there literally vibrating her wing muscles in increasing her, her internal temperature so that she can keep those eggs and larvae warm as they're developing. And this is incredibly energy ex energetically expensive. Um, Dave Golson in his book, Bumblebees, Behavior, Ecology, and Conservation, says that he believes this energy expenditure in terms of calories would require around 600 milligrams of sugar per day. In order to get that much sugar, sort of your average flour, and this was based in, in the UK, not necessarily here in the US, but he estimated that that's around 6,000 flowers a day that would have to be visited by a bumblebee queen to get enough resources just for herself to keep her temperature at that level. And remember, this can take a fair bit of time, right? So the eggs hatch, it takes about four days for the eggs to hatch, and then the larvae start eating and they eat for almost two weeks. So this is a, a really energetically expensive time for that queen to be, to be keeping that nest warm, but then also continually bringing in enough resources for that nest. And because of that, she only lays this first brood, she lays six to six, to, you know, so eight to 16 or so eggs, and then stops. She doesn't keep laying eggs. She waits until that first brood is basically getting ready to go before she starts laying her second brood, just because it isn't possible for her to do more of that. 
So the eggs hatch in about four days. And this is what the larvae then look like. The larvae start eating that big brood cell. The larvae go through what are called four different instars. An instar is sort of this, the, the animal grows. And once they've reached sort of the, their, the, the extent of their current structure, they need to sort of shed that and then grow into a, a bigger version of itself. That's what an instar is in, in sort of layman's terms. They go through four of those in SARS, and that can take 10 to 14 days. So they're constantly just eating those pollen and nectar cakes in that brood cell being incubated by, by their mom. And then after that 10 to 14 days, they, um, they pupate. So just like sort of a caterpillar that, that pupates and then emerges as a winged adult, um, bumblebees do the same thing. So a bumblebee baby is basically this worm that you see here. That's a baby bumblebee. Um, and then they pupate and then emerge as winged adults. And while they're pupae, as you can see in sort of the pictures here and in the, in the diagrams, that they're mostly colorless or they're white um, until they emerge as winged adults. And then their coloration actually starts coming, coming into their, to their hairs on their bodies. Um, and so they pupate, the pupation takes around 14 days, so it's another two weeks. And so from the total time from egg laying to emergence of a winged adult is at a very short time period would be four weeks. Um, and then probably more like five weeks is the time period that it would take. Once the, the larvae pupate, that's when the queen no longer has to feed her her larvae anymore and she can leave the nest then and start bringing in more resources and so that she can start laying her second brood and that's why on that chart that i showed you that i'm going to show you again here in a second had that break between the first brood and the second brood she doesn't lay her second sort of clutch of eggs until those first ones have pupated which releases her to be able to spend more time gathering the resources to to to, to raise that second brood so this is where we sort of are, is where this arrow is pointing here. We're, we're now, hopefully you can sort of understand what happens up to this point. The queen continues laying eggs. The second brood is, is developing at this point because the pupation takes two weeks and those workers then emerge. This is the time where the cuckoo bumblebee sort of enters the fray. It's some sort of touchy, point in here where the queen, or the, I'm sorry, the female cuckoo bumblebee will choose to invade the nest. And it's a touchy period about whether she invades a nest with few workers, making it easy for her to invade and take over, or whether there she goes for a larger nest that has more workers that could bring in more resources for her, but it makes it harder for her to overtake that nest. And just so you understand, a cuckoo bumblebee is one that doesn't collect its own pollen. It's dependent on a host to do that for it. So that's why it's taking over that nest, is it needs the worker cast of its host species to bring in the resources to feed its young. So if we sort of remove the, the true bumblebee and start looking at the cuckoo annual life cycle, you can see sort of here we have all of the host information happening up until the, the cuckoo, which, which emerges from hibernation significantly later than its host species, um, and invades the nest, you know, somewhere in, um, you know, the beginning of the social phase of, of the, the true bumblebee nest. They do not lay any worker cast. So all of the members that evolve or, or that come from their eggs are either a, a reproductive female or a male. So the only reproductive members and again, they're going to be coming out, you know, five to 10 weeks after they have first invaded that nest. And then the cuckoo is going to um, enter hibernation, you know, similar process. The males will die, they'll mate, and the males will die off, and the queen will enter hibernation. So if you sort of look at it from this perspective, the, the larger blue information here is sort of a life cycle of the bumblebee, the true bumblebee, as we've imagined it. And then here, here comes the cuckoo bumblebee, which emerges, um, you know, later from hibernation, but then it also enters hibernation earlier um, than the true bumblebee. So kind of an interesting um, biology. It has a shorter life cycle. We're going to talk in a minute about how this life cycle potentially evolved. 
Um, but, but just know that it's compressed. It's probably shorter on the front end, so it emerges later from hibernation, and then they enter hibernation earlier. So something about their biology also allows them to overwinter longer. And that's also an interesting process that I don't think is fully understood or appreciated. So when they go to invade the nest, you know, they need to somehow find the nest. It's believed that scent probably plays an important role here. It's been shown that some species can particularly follow the scent or, or um, the scent cues for a particular species of bumblebees. They take over, once they find the nest, they need to take over reproduction. They usually will eliminate the host queen, either by killing it or forcing it to become the equivalent of a worker. I think it's usually a, a killing or eliminating. Um, and then they'll sometimes go in and just start eliminating developing larvae and eggs as well. So they'll start eating um, developing larvae and they'll eat the eggs and then they'll start laying their own brood and the worker cast that's in there um, starts bringing in resources, which, which will then start focusing the reproduction purely on, um, uh, on the development of the cuckoo bumblebees offspring. Um, they also need to avoid revolt. So, you know, those workers aren't related to this bee, but they're doing a lot of work for it. So somehow it needs to, to regulate what those workers are doing. And it's believed that, you know, chemicals probably play a significant part here. Um, as well as odors and scents. And so, so this, this female bumblebee that's taking over, you know, this nest needs to sort of become dominant. I put honey regurgitation on here just as I was doing some research for this. I realized that sometimes when, when workers revolt against this cuckoo bumblebee, they'll actually regurgitate the, the honey that's in their crops onto the cuckoo bumblebee, essentially making it so sticky that it can't move around anymore. And this is one of the ways that, that uh, <laughs> cuckoo bumblebees find their demise is if the workers revolt to the point where they spit honey all over it and make it so sticky that it can't do its work anymore. So this is one of the ways that workers exhibit their dominance back towards the cuckoo queen. Pretty interesting biology. Um, once that sort of life cycle has, has done its part, the reproductive members have been produced. Um, it, it's, it's similar in that the reproductives will go out and try to reproduce. Different from a true bumblebee nest, um, it's believed that the cuckoo females do not return to the nest, that they just go out and live in the environment, build up their fat reserves, and enter their, um, you know, find a mate, and then, uh, and then enter their hibernation. And just to emphasize this, I know I said it earlier, but it's believed that they hibernate up to a third longer than, um, than true bumblebees. So just an interesting part of their physiology that allows them to do that. It's obviously, you know, it's expensive to, to spend time in the ground when you're not eating anything and they need to have significant fat reserves more so than true bumblebees. Want to just touch quickly upon sort of the evolution of this and how we believe, you know, nest usurpation um, happened or, or came to be. It's believed that sort of the cuckoos, well, it was once thought that, that Scytheris or cuckoos were in a completely different genus from the true bumblebees. And it's now believed that, um, or we have evidence now that they're in the same group. They're just another subgenus and they evolved likely from true bumblebees. And it's believed that the, the impetus for this was probably nest site competition or differences in emergence time. So a, a queen bumblebee emerged later than another species and it had to find a nest and it wasn't able to find a suitable nest site of its own. So it had to take over another, um, another species nest or, or yeah, another, or, or even a conspecific nest, take over another individual of the same species. And it's that level of competition that sort of over time, over evolutionary time, led to sort of the loss of the ability to collect pollen and the loss of the ability um, to have a worker cast and just developed into what we would call obligate um, parasitism or, or cuckoos. In the bumblebee world, in addition to the Scytheris or the cuckoo bumblebees, there's also examples of faculitative um, usurpation. So, so some bumblebees don't necessarily have to, they have the ability to lay workers or probably have the ability to lay workers, but they've adapted a lifestyle of, you know, taking the nest of other species. And so there's sort of a continuum of behaviors between what we would call the true bumblebees, the sort of normal life cycle that we usually talk about, 
And then there's a couple of the alpino bombus species that um, that choose to do this. They can lay workers, they can collect pollen, but they are alpino bombus, so they live in the far, far north. They have a very short field season. Um, and so this is bombus hyperborus and, and, and bombus nat vg. And they, and, you know, instead of spawning their own nests, they invade the nests of others and they take over. Um, and they essentially live a very similar life to a cuckoo bumblebee, but they're, they're, they're in the alpino bombus. So they have this sort of, they choose this life cycle or this lifestyle rather than being obligated to do it because it, it's easier for them. They emerge later, the season's really short in the north, so they do this. There's also an example in the Thoracobombus, um, Bombus inexpectatus, that is essentially an obligate parasite at this point. It's not a cuckoo bumblebee in that it's not in the subgenus Scytheris, but it has very reduced corbicula, so it doesn't can't really collect pollen anymore, and it's never been observed laying workers. It's only been observed laying reproductive members of the colony, and it invades the nest of a, of a, of a closely related species. So super interesting sort of continuum of behaviors between what we would consider like a true normal social bumblebee and Scytheris, which sort of gives us some insight into the evolution of this behavior over a long, long, long period of time. Um, I'd love to talk more about this, but time is <laughs> marching on here and I still have a lot to cover. So I'm going to move on. Interestingly, the, the geographic distribution of Scytheris is um, we don't find them at sort of the extremities of, of the bumblebees. So the, the where you see sort of the light gray is where we have both true bumblebees and Scytheris. And where we have, I'm sorry, where we have the dark gray is where you see, or the darkest gray is where we have cuckoo bumblebees and true bumblebees. In the light gray, like in South America here, is where we only have true bumblebees, so no cuckoo bumblebees. And then the lightest gray is where we have neither. Um, and so you can see in the far northern parts of, of, of the overall Bombus range, there are no cuckoo bumblebees. And then in the far south, there's also none. And interestingly, the only place that we find them in the tropics is in the sort of higher elevations of southern Mexico and Guatemala, where it's cool enough to believe that this you know, lifestyle has emerged. So that's sort of our dive into the cuckoo um, things as we sort of, as you remember, we were last talking about true bumblebees as they were beginning to pupate and emerge, their first brood was emerging. We're going to go back there now to the true bumblebees and leave the cuckoo world behind. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions, but we're going to, we're going to move on here. Um, so we're now at the period where the first reproductive brood, so the, the, the queen has now put out her first workers, they've started bringing resources, the second workers, they're bringing even more resources. And so at this point, she starts producing the reproductive members of the colony. And there's no real understanding of, of how or why this happens um, in, in terms of why an egg develops as a queen rather as a worker. Um, there's some indication that it's the rate at which they're fed or the amount at which they're fed. There could be some hormones involved. Um, it's likely that, that well, it's believed that, that basically the queen stops producing a juvenile hormone at this point, which allows sort of the ovaries to develop more and, 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 the, and the overall larvae and pupae to develop into bigger individuals with mature ovaries um, and such. And it is, it is believed that, that when the queen stops producing that pheromone, in other words, when she starts producing the reproductive members of the colony, that the atmosphere in the nest drastically changes. That pheromone, that juvenile pheromone um, that she was using, not only regulated whether their eggs developed into workers or into queens, it also helped regulate the workers in the nest and keep them in their place. So they didn't develop, their ovaries didn't develop, and so they weren't able to lay eggs. But that changes once she starts producing the reproductive members of the colony, and all of a sudden the workers come into their place and they're like, whoa, this is an interesting world. We can lay eggs too. And they start competing with their mom a little bit, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. But, but that start, that's where we start this queen worker conflict. So you can see that the bumblebee queen just has a really challenging <laughs> lifestyle. From the moment it emerges from hibernation, it's, it's faced with a ton of, of things to overcome. Um, so 
why the queen worker conflicts happen. It, it relates to the genetic makeup of bumblebees and how their, their sex is determined, how the sex of the offspring is determined. And that affects the relatedness and therefore how bumblebees react to each other. This is relatedness of, of us, they, of, of, of humans. We have sort of what we would consider a, a, a normal way of determining sex in that we sort of have this XY determination. Because of the way that we, that we're related to each other and how our sex is determined, we are equally related to our parents as we are to our siblings. So our parents have 50% of our genes, our siblings have 50% of our genes, and our offspring all have 50% of our genes, whether they're male or female. It doesn't matter. We're equally related to all of those siblings. That's just how our genetic makeup works. So those of us around us are all equally related. We're a family unit. We might consider taking care of them all the same because of that in our immediate family area. It's very different than that in bumblebees and that the queen bumblebee here is, is what we call diploid. She has two copies of her genome. But the male over here on the right only has a single copy of the genome. And so what happens is when the queen lays her eggs, if she does not fertilize the egg with, sper with sperm, the individual will emerge as a male. If she does fertilize it with a sperm from the previous year, oops, then the, the offspring will develop into a diploid female a di or a, a new queen, whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> but that affects how the queen is related to these different individuals. So, so she passes on, because she's passing on essentially half of her genome in the egg, it's not, um, it's not, it's not the easiest thing to describe in a, in a quick couple of minutes here. But, but basically an unfertilized egg develops into a male. She's 50% related to that individual. It has 50% of the genes that she has. The same thing is true of the diploid worker. She's passed along sort of half of herself and then half of the male or the entirety of the male that she, she mated with. So she's 50% related to her, um, her female workers and 50% related to her, her males. So the queen's relationship to this is basically the same as ours. However, when we start looking at workers versus their brothers, they only share 25% of their genes because basically they're only, only on average, half of what was shared with, their, with, with the male is also passed on to the female. So on average, a, a, a worker is only 25% related to her male off or her brothers, basically, while she's 70% related to her sisters because she has 50% from her mom and 100% from her dad. So she's 75% related to her workers. So she is motivated from an evolutionary perspective for helping her sister and less so for her brothers. And interestingly enough, if the queen or if the worker starts laying eggs, which she's a female, she can lay eggs, she just can't inject it with sperm and fertilize it so she can lay male offspring, she's actually more closely related to her own male offspring than she is to her brother. So that's where the motivation comes for her laying her own eggs in the nest, which obviously leads to a conflict because the queen is only 25% related to the, the offspring of her workers. I know that was probably way too complicated for the two minutes I was able to spend on it, but I hope you get some understanding of, of what, that, what that's like and why. And just to give you some indication of what that looks like, here's a little video of what a queen will do to a worker when they find, um, when she finds her laying an egg. She does not like that behavior. She immediately uh, sends a physical message to that worker offspring and removes it from the nest and stops it laying eggs. And then as we can see in this next video, um, she will then proceed to um, return to the area and she'll actually eat the eggs of the, of, of the workers. So she'll make sure that the, that the queen or that the nest doesn't spend its resources developing offspring that are not hers. So this conflict sort of goes on and on in many different ways. Um, in more ways than I really have time to um, describe. 
the way that she manages this conflict is again so this goes both ways sometimes you can get workers that will eat the eggs of the queen or try to you'll get workers that try to kick um larvae out of the nest or carry them out of the nest and throw them out of the nest the queen is working on physical intimidation. Sometimes if there's so many workers in the nest, you can get physical intimidation in the, in the other direction. So things are just sort of constantly at odds here and it makes it a tricky time to be a queen bumblebee. Um, so that's sort of this queen worker conflict period that happens for an extended period of time, really for the remainder of the period of time in the nest and sometimes can, can escalate. If the queen's able to make it through this and, and, and get those reproductive members of the colony out of the nest, she'll start producing the new females, the queen females and the males, and they'll go out and, and try to find a nest. As you can imagine from all the different interactions in the nest, many colonies just don't survive to this point, but it, it does happen. But the, the purpose now is the queen has to forage and, and use the resources of the nest to build up her fat reserves so she can survive that winter. Males eventually leave the nest. Um, and once they leave the nest, it's believed they really don't return. They just spend their time looking for um, females and, and trying to mate. So males fly around, they look for females, they use different methods. When they do mate, that mating process can last for 30 minutes or sometimes more. Um, males usually, all, or I'm sorry, the new queens usually only mate with one male or on average it's one male. Um, and while that male is mating, the reason that it takes 30 minutes is it's believed the male actually, or it's, it's known that the male tries to basically inject a block after they've mated to prevent additional sperm from getting into the female. So that, that's one of the things that happens um, in, in the reproduction cycle that sort of, well, it, it ensures the male's genes are passed on more than any other males. But it's also important we could go back to that haplodiploidy thing and talk about what would happen with multiple mates for that queen. And it would change that relatedness structure in the nest dramatically as well. So I'm not gonna get into those details, I don't have time, but it's definitely an interesting part of the, uh, of the biology. Um, after mating, um, again, the queen is gonna spend most of the time um, building up her fat reserves, foraging, and then beginning to look for a hibernacula. Um, we don't know that much about hibernation, uh, especially at a species by species level. Generally, they're in shaded areas. Trees seem to be important. Banks without dense vegetation, north facing slopes in some areas, probably the more further north you get, south facing slopes also become important as we talked about earlier. Bare earth, moss, tree litter, leaves, needles, all seem to be important. The differences in depth have been measured basically two to 15 centimeters below the surface, really probably depending on species and the different environments that are out there. Um, cool little video here of a, of a queen um, bombus impatiens digging her hibernacula. Um, so you can sort of see what this looks like. She's actually physically, unlike the nest, which she needs a pre-existing area, the queen actually physically extracts her hibernacula and buries herself under there. Um, so that's something you can actually look for is these little tumulae of, of, of dirt outside of a hole. It might be a way to, to help find bumblebee nests or bumblebee overwintering sites. Again, as you sort of think about, um, th this is an unknown portion of the bumblebee life cycle. We're trying to learn more about it. We started this website called Queen Quest, where if you've found overwintering queens or you want to go look for them, there's opportunities for you to do that. And I would encourage you to go to queenquest.org and help us learn more about over, overwintering queens. Um, I was going to talk a little bit more about how we find nests um, and some of the research that we've done, but I can see that I'm out of time. So I'm, I'm, I think at this point, I'm probably just going to stop. I'm happy to stick around for 15 minutes or so and, and answer any questions that you all might have. Um, but I really appreciate you bearing with me and, and um, allowing me to try to get through as much of this material as I, as I was able to today. Um, I think it's a super fascinating part of the world. It's hard to believe that there's these ubiquitous animals that we really know so little about. And I, I appreciate you sharing me 
sharing what I know, allowing me to share what I know and also what I don't know about these things. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of questions, so I'm happy to begin to address those. Um, and thanks for spending the time with me and I'm sorry I went a little over. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much, Rich. You're getting lots of love in the chat. People are really enjoying this and explaining what are, I think, really confusing topics very well. Um, so we'll jump into the questions. Like Rich said, we'll have about 15 minutes. There's no way we're going to get through the 50 questions that we have. Um, but yeah. there's a lot of really good questions. I'm really just like great audience participation in this one. Um, so the first I'm going to jump in, a few people have asked, is there a possibility that the Atlas program will expand into the Northeast? And if not, what can people do to help support that effort and what needs to happen? Because there's lots of people that want to see that happen. I definitely think there's a chance it will expand to the Northeast. Um, you know, Vermont and Maine have sort of, in some ways, spurred the original idea for this and that they did their own statewide atlases. They were structured a little bit differently than the work that we're doing. Um, but it's been almost a decade since those states began theirs, and it's almost time to think about sort of reproducing those efforts and seeing how things have changed in the last decade. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're super interested in, in, in making this a nationwide effort. I think it's in a lot of ways it makes sense to have this collected at a nationwide scale so that we can get a snapshot in time and, and repeat the effort, you know, like the like a breeding bird atlas survey that happens every year so that we can sort of have this structured way of monitoring these species and again learn learn more about where the animals that we're most concerned about are living and 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 working. So I definitely think there's not We've expanded every year. We started in, with three states in 2018, and we're six years later, and we're in 20 states. So I, I won't be shocked if if it continues to expand. Um, you know, things that you can do to help now is are things like encouraging your state wildlife agency to care about bumblebees and other insects. That's something that you can do is reach out and make sure that your state wildlife agency cares about bumblebees and other insects. Um, that's some advocacy that you can do. Just participating in Bumblebee Watch or even iNaturalist and, and sharing observations are other things that, that you can certainly do to contribute as well. It helps us learn about what plants they're using and at least where, where we find them. So lots to do. Um, and obviously Queen Quest and other um, nesting biology stuff can be learned no matter where it's happening. So I think there's lots of opportunities to get involved. And yeah, I think we, we, we do hope to continue expanding. I can't make any promises, but, um, but yeah, it's a... I think it's a scalable program that we could bring to new areas if there was sufficient interest and obviously funding to, to make it happen. It does require, you know, human resources to do quite a bit of, of the work. Uh, thank you, Rich. It's great to see how much it's grown even in the past couple of years. So it's a good sign. Um, all right. So Kate had a question and I've heard other people ask mm -hmm. sort of similar questions. Um, they've had bumblebee nests in the soffit of their shed every year. And Kate loves them and just wants them to do their thing, but they potentially need to remove the shed. And so they are wondering uh, what can they do to possibly help alleviate any um, disturbance to this nest? Can they build a nest somewhere else? Can they move it to a different location? They just don't want to disturb the nest. Yeah. Um... I mean, the best thing to do is to, to do something in the winter. So, you know, when the bumblebees are overwintering, they're going to be in the ground somewhere. They're not going to be in the soft bit of a shed. Um, at that time, even if you couldn't do the work in the winter, you could spend time patching up the holes that they're using. <laughs> Maybe it's an old shed and there's so many holes that there's no way to patch it up, which is also quite possible. But, you know, patch that shed up and make sure they can't get in and out there um, and really prevent that, you know, block all those holes or as many as you can to prevent them from getting in or out. You're not going to disturb them in the winter time. They're not. They're not in there. They're overwintering somewhere separately from their nest, um, and then you know, then they'll nest somewhere else. That's fine. Um, they're not going to. Yeah, like I said, they're not going to overwinter there. So anything you do in the winter is going to be preparation for the following year. And then you could, you know, if you blocked all those entrances, then there's no way they would be in there the following summer, and you could do whatever deconstruction or reconstruction that you needed to do. During the field season, moving a nest is possible, but it is not recommended. Um, you know, I've, I've tried it. We get phone calls all the time about, can you help me move this bumblebee nest? And I've participated in a few of those. Oftentimes when I move them, the nest will perish shortly afterwards, which could be a natural thing. The, the, the nest could have been at that phase or 
you know, just moving a nest to an environment that's similar enough where they can continue to thrive is, I think it's just a hard thing to do. Um, and, and it's easier like in the, in the soffit of a, of a shed than it is underground. Like moving an underground nest is virtually impossible because you'd have to dig it up. Um, but it's just really, really hard. The best thing to do is, is just block it off, you know, like try to avoid the area as much as possible during the summertime, let them do their thing. And then as soon as you no longer see bumblebees flying, go in there and do whatever you want to do. They're not, you're not going to disturb anything if you don't see bumblebees flying in and out of it. The nest is the nest at that point. The queens are doing their thing elsewhere and, and you can do whatever you need to do. Good advice. All right, another habitat question from Catherine. They would love to know more about overwintering queens and habitat associations. One of the questions they've been considering is how to manage for cavity nesting bees and forest management and vegetation projects in light of potential status changes for species like the Western bumblebees. So mm -hmm. when they're considering project design criteria, how large of a buffer around a nest would you consider to protect and lessen disturbance for overwintering queens? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> I think on our, the last podcast I did with you, Rachel, you asked me if I'd like to talk to a bee and I said, yes, because <laughs> I'd like to answer all these questions. Uh, but boy, at, a, at that species level, we just we just don't know. We do know that some species overwinter very close to their nest, like Bombus impatiens, which is an eastern species. It's not imperiled at all. It's been found nesting or overwintering at very high densities just outside its nest entrance. So they basically crawl out of the nest and overwinter right there. But other species have been found, you know, quite some distance from from overwintering. So it's really it's really hard to to say. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, we don't know a whole lot about bumblebee dispersal, when it happens, where it happens, what time of year it happens, whether males do it or queens do it or they both do it. It's just it's just a black hole. And, and I, I have the same, same questions for you for a lot of the same reasons as, as especially Western forests think about, you know, forest management for fires. What are the potential impacts that those thinning projects could have on overwintering or nesting queens? I have all of the same questions for you. Um, and 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 the same answers as you, unfortunately. Um, but I guess I would just recommend, like, in those environments, keep as much structure and heterogeneity as you possibly can. Um, you know, leave some areas the same. Try, you know, our general recommendation is treat more no more than a third of an area in any in any given year. And if you just sort of think about sort of the nest as the the entrance hole or, or the as the center point of that you know, build a, I don't know, probably as much as a five kilometer circle around that, which is potential overwintering grounds, right? And then treat no more of a third of that in, in any given year. That would be like my best case scenario recommendation. I also understand that large land management agencies are managing for multiple species and not just one species. So there's lots of things to think about. If you want to chat about it more, send me an email and we can you know, engage in a, in a longer conversation. That would be my sort of off the cuff answer to that question. That was a good, very detailed question. <laughs> this is a good <laughs> answer. Um, all right, another question, kind of in a, another habitat one, I guess, um, is from Jackie, is wondering why the nesting site is different from the overwintering site. I think the simple answer to that is a lot of diseases and pests build up in the nest over the course of the season. Bumblebees are kind of, they don't have a really neat nest like a honeybee. It's kind of messy. And by the end, there's wax moths in there and, and other pathogens and parasites. And it's probably not a very safe place to spend the winter. It's probably the short answer. It's also probably not warm enough um, in terms of like being in a small encapsulated space is probably better for the queen's physiology. Those are my quick guesses at that. All right. So Lucy is wondering that obviously prevention is best in terms of um, disturbing a nest or disturbing an overwintering queen. And they are a professional gardener and put off spring gardening as long as possible. But if they're planting woody plants in the spring, um, what would they, what would you recommend to Lucy to do if they do disturb a nest? A nest or an overwintering site? 
they said a nest, but I'm assuming if they're in the spring, they're talking about an overwintering site. Yeah. I, I mean, I would just try to rebury the queen. It, there's some evidence that that's possible and, and actually can be successful. Um, you know, don't force it underground or whatever. Like if they're going to be up, let them be up and maybe it was time to wake up. I would generally just, you know, like if, if you can easily rebury it and they haven't been too active, I would, I would try to do that. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, the best thing to do is probably just to re- let nature run its course. If, if it was time for that species to emerge, and be successful, it will, and, and it's possible that it won't. And and the flowers that you're planting and the shrubs that you're putting in the ground, I think in the long run will have, you know, more benefit than cost in that in that scenario. So I agree with you that this, these are trade offs, and we just need to do the best that we possibly can. You know, the other thing you could do if there really are no sources of nectar around is you could you know put out a thimble of like fifty percent sugar 50% water um, that, that could give them some calories to, to help get them through a, a, a cold period or something like that. But it's not sustainable for a long period of time. So those would be my, again, off the cuff answers to that question. Okay, great. All right, time for a couple more here. You talked a lot about cuckoo bees, which was really interesting. Uh, it's kind of a new topic for our webinar series. How common are, and this is probably one of those questions that you might not be able to answer, but how common are cuckoo bees versus bumblebees on a percentage basis. Do you have any sense of that? I don't have the specific numbers, um, but but it is quite rare. Like, so there's, I think there's five species of bumblebees in, in or of cuckoo bumblebees in North America. I may be wrong about that, but I think it's five. And so five out of 50, we would expect them to make up sort of 10% of the bumblebee observations in the world. And I think they make up quite a bit less than that, like probably half of that 5% of the observations. Some of that is, could be a factor of, of when we sample, right? We're out looking for bumblebees when workers are active and that's when cuckoo bumblebees aren't really out. So that could be some factor. It could be a sampling effect, but it also is probably just generally that cuckoos are, are pretty rare. But I think in a lot of systems, like they've looked at especially in like Northern Alpine or, or, or really Arctic environments, they found like over 50% of the nests are parasitized by cuckoo bumblebees. So they're, I think they're more common than we generally think, at least in some environments, less so in others. It's interesting, like my colleague, Katie Lamke, that works like in Nebraska and Missouri, like I don't think she's seen a single cuckoo bumblebee, or like maybe one cuckoo bumblebee in the five years of the of those two projects, you know, like so... They're just seem to be rare in some environments, but we've got, you know, there are some species that are quite common in the Pacific Northwest, Bombus insularis and Bombus flavidus are, you know, pretty common. Um, but I will say that, that, that some species of cuckoo bumblebees are our most imperiled in the world, like Bombus variabilis and, and Bombus sucklii have virtually disappeared from the vast majority of, of their ranges. Um, and they have very specific sort of, it's believed at least they have very fairly specific host situations. And, and the hosts have also been in decline for, for Bombus succulii, Bombus occidentalis is, is one of the close hosts. And for, for Bombus variabilis, it was Bombus pennsylvanicus. And that species went through a period of, of significant decline too. So hosts can become more rare than their, than their I'm sorry, Cuckoo bumblebees can become more rare than their hosts because of that obligate relationship. Mm. Yeah. Good question. All right. Yeah, it is a good question. There's so many good questions. Um, David is wondering, they had a bumblebee nest in their composter last year and was unable to positively identify it. Uh, but when disturbed, the nest hissed convincingly. <laughs> I love that description. Is there a potential, a potential ID characteristic or will all nests engage in this warning behavior? Uh, I will say that some species are definitely more aggressive than others. Um, I've, I've like picked up bird, like a bird nest with a, with a bumblebee nest of it, a Bombus melanopygus. And like in broad daylight, I've picked up the nest that was very active and like nothing. <laughs> you know, like they were just like, what's up? <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's other species like I, I, stepped near a, a Bombus fervidus nest, which was on the surface of the ground and, and I got stung very quickly. They were very aggressive. So I think it's 
there is sort of a species by species signature, you know, based on how the nest reacts. But but I think any nest that got bumped, you would see, you would hear that that fanning sound. Um, generally speaking, like when when the nest is active. I mentioned that the temperature of the nest needs to stay fairly consistent. And I think the temperature is like 30 degrees Celsius, which is I think above 80 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of the optimal temperature for, for a bumblebee nest. And they stay fairly consistent. So, you know, like there, there's some bumblebees workers that their sole job is to like regulate the temperature of the nest. And so they're sometimes sitting by the entrance, fanning their wings, like just increasing or decreasing air circulation. And so like they're, they're ready to like vibrate their wings, you know, just generally speaking. So I think that's a, a signature that you'd see with most nests. An interesting anecdote, anecdote that's not related to, to your question, but I'll dive into here as we zoom well past 15 minutes and the number of questions is <laughs> up, not down. Um, but uh, Dave Wilson, again, who I mentioned, uh, who, you know, if you're interested and want to go deeper into this, I would just highly recommend you purchase his book. It's called the Ecology and Conservation of Bumblebees. It's, it's really good. Um, he has an anecdote in there where he he had a, a commercial colony of bumblebees that he was trying to, to kill um, because it was the end of the season and research was done. He put it in like a sub, sub zero degree freezer overnight. And then the, and the next day he pulled it out of the freezer and they were totally active. <laughs> <laughs> they had none of not one of them had died. So the whole bumblebee colony had just collapsed around the queen and they'd regulated their own temperature and kept it at 30 degrees Celsius all night in this freezing, you know, freezer. So they, their ability to like do things is incredible. They're incredible creatures. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, ha, you thought you got us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know we're going past. We'll end on this one last question because I think, you know, we talk about cuckoo bees being parasitic and it's like, ah, maybe people don't like cuckoo bees anymore. So I think maybe this is a relevant question from Edna wondering, are there any positive aspects to the cuckoo bee? Which I appreciate that question. I mean, yeah, as a conservation biologist, every, every species has its place and deserves its place. And for us to, to, to play creator and decide which species are valuable and which ones is not is this is a silly undertaking. I think we should, we should value all species and, and believe that we don't fully understand everything. Um, uh, you know, another positive aspect I think you could consider for, for cuckoos is, you know, sort of think about it as a predator prey relationship and that predators usually take out the weakest members of, of, a, of a herd, for instance, and they, and in turn strengthen the genetic stock of, of the herd. And I think you could think about the cuckoos as the same towards true bumblebees and that they're they're helping true bumblebees find better nesting locations that can't be detected of being more successful at reproducing and repelling out those and, and other, you know, cuckoo bumblebees are just one threat to a true drum. There's other, you know, like predators that are trying to get in those nests and take over them. And I think ultimately you could see them as strengthening the stock of, of our true bumblebees and making them more important. And, you know, they're also pollinators. They're out, the males are out visiting flowers as much as a, a fly or a, a butterfly, you know, they're they're visiting flowers and inadvertently moving pollen around. So they definitely have their place in, in the world and, and they're important. And we we should certainly not believe that we fully understand the system and keep them all alive. I that that's a really important aspect. And I'm glad. That question was asked because I think a lot of people feel like, oh, those, we don't want those cuckoo bees around, but they're, they're pretty amazing, fascinating creatures. Insect world is so full of cool biology. It, yeah, I'm glad we do webinars like this and podcasts so that I can keep learning all the cool things that insects do and, and share a little bit too. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rich, and thank you to our audience for just these great questions. If you haven't um, checked out the Bug Banter podcast, it's called Bug Banter with the Xerxes Society. Rich just did an episode on bumblebees. So if you want to learn more, check that podcast out. Thank you so much for your time, Rich. This was so wonderful. You're getting lots and lots of feedback um, in the chat and all those extra questions or comments about how great this was. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Amber, for your help. And um, yeah, we look forward to having you all back on our, our next webinar. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot.